Thank you, Ken Stevenson and Jason Turner of the Northwest African American Museum's African American Cultural Ensemble for that powerful rendition of Lift Every Voice and Sing in tribute to James Baldwin. Hello and welcome. I'm Lanisha DeBartolaben with the Northwest African American Museum. Thank you all for tuning in. As we begin, we acknowledge that we are on the traditional land of the first people of Seattle, the Duwamish people, past and present. We honor with gratitude the land itself and the Duwamish people. We also honor the Coast Salish people of this region. We acknowledge that we are on the unceded ancestral lands of a people who are still here, continuing to honor and bring to light their ancient heritage. We are grateful for our African ancestors who survived the Ma'afa, the Middle Passage, who endured the violence of slavery and the indignity of racial oppression, who had the courage to pack up and head north and west to the Northwest, who blazed trails for us to be here and to be ourselves here. We thank our partners at Elliott Bay Book Company for co-presenting tonight's conversation with us. Tonight is about the most influential writer in our nation's history, James Arthur Baldwin. Born August 2nd, 1924 in Harlem, New York. James Baldwin, like no one else, eloquently analyzed and insightfully articulated the realities of American racism, Black frustration, and human hope. 
all in one concise sentence after another, always flowing thoughtfully, beautifully, and brilliantly. We all have a James Baldwin moment, a time in our lives when his words ignited a fire within us and made us come alive. You have a James Baldwin moment, and so do I. His writings were raw, honest, and undeniably true. James Baldwin believed that we can all become better than we were, better than we are. But the price, he said, is enormous. And people, he said, are not yet willing to pay the price. In an essay entitled, An Open Letter to My Sister Angela Davis, written in 1970, Baldwin stated, if they take you in the morning, they will come for us that night. Therefore, peace. We are here to learn from his writings, to pay tribute to his wisdom, and to honor his truth-bearing witness. James Baldwin fits within a historical trajectory of influential and powerful Black writers, such as those that came before him, like David Walker, Frederick Douglass, Ida B. Wells, and Zora Neale Hurston. His peers, such as Richard Wright, Ralph Ellison, and Lorraine Hansberry, and those that came after him, such as ta Coates, Ibram X. Kendi, Nicole Hannah-Jones, and our very own Marcus Harrison Green. Let's watch a brief clip right now about James Baldwin. Over the course of the 1960s, the FBI amassed almost 2,000 documents in an investigation into one of America's most celebrated minds. The subject of this inquiry was a writer named James Baldwin. At the time, the FBI investigated many artists and thinkers, but most of their files were a fraction of the size of Baldwin's. During the years when the FBI hounded him, he became one of the best-selling black authors in the world. So what made James Baldwin loom so large in the imaginations of both the public and the authorities? Born in Harlem in 1924, he was the oldest of nine children. At age 14, he began to work as a preacher. By delivering sermons, he developed his voice as a writer, but also grew conflicted about the church's stance on racial inequality and homosexuality. After high school, he began writing novels and essays while taking a series of odd jobs, but the issues that had driven him away from the church were still inescapable in his daily life. Constantly confronted with racism and homophobia, he was angry and disillusioned and yearned for a less restricted life. So in 1948, at the age of 24, he moved to Paris on a writing fellowship. From France, he published his first novel, Go Tell It on the Mountain, in 1953. Set in Harlem, the book explores the church as a source of both repression and hope. It was popular with both black and white readers. As he earned acclaim for his fiction, Baldwin gathered his thoughts on race, class, culture, and exile in his 1955 extended essay, Notes of a Native Son. Meanwhile, the civil rights movement was gaining momentum in America. Black Americans were making incremental gains at registering to vote and voting, but were still denied basic dignities in schools, on buses, in the workforce, and in the armed services. Though he lived primarily in France for the rest of his life, Baldwin was deeply invested in the movement and keenly aware of his country's unfulfilled promise. He had seen family, friends, and neighbors spiral into addiction, incarceration, and suicide. He believed their fates originated from the constraints of a segregated society. In 1963, he published The Fire Next Time, an arresting portrait of racial strife in which he held white America accountable. But he also went further, arguing that racism hurt white people too. In his view, everyone was inextricably enmeshed in the same social fabric. He had long believed that people are trapped in history and history is trapped in them. Baldwin's role in the civil rights movement went beyond observing and reporting. 
He also traveled through the American South, attending rallies, giving lectures of his own. He debated both white politicians and black activists, including Malcolm X, and served as a liaison between black activists and intellectuals and white establishment leaders like Robert Kennedy. Because of Baldwin's unique ability to articulate the causes of social turbulence in a way that white audiences were willing to hear, Kennedy and others tended to see him as an ambassador for black Americans, a label Baldwin rejected. And at the same time, his faculty with words led the FBI to view him as a threat. Even within the civil rights movement, Baldwin could sometimes feel like an outsider for his choice to live abroad, as well as his sexuality, which he explored openly in his writing at a time when homophobia ran rampant. Throughout his life, Baldwin considered it his role to bear witness. Unlike many of his peers, he lived to see some of the victories of the civil rights movement. But the continuing racial inequalities in the United States weighed heavily on him. Though he may have felt trapped in his moment in history, his words have made generations of people feel known, while guiding them toward a more nuanced understanding of society's most complex issues. Learn about other trailblazers of the civil rights movement with these videos. James Baldwin was a prolific writer who fearlessly held a mirror to American culture in order to reflect its pitfalls and its potential, its weaknesses and its wonders. He was all about freedom, true freedom, freedom of self and freedom for others, whether it be racial, sexual, spiritual, or political, and all the ways these intersect. His works have been canonized among the greatest of American literature, but Baldwin saw as his greatest gift the ability to bear witness to truth. And in the tradition of James Baldwin, our very own Marcus Harrison Green, born and raised in South Seattle, founder and publisher of the South Seattle Emerald columnist with the Seattle Times, recipient of the Seattle Human Rights Commission's Individual Human Rights Leader Award, our Marcus Harrison Green stands up for justice with that same spirit of change in his writings and now in his new book entitled Readying to Rise. Like James Baldwin, Marcus Harrison Green inspires truth, action, and change within us and among us. The Northwest African American Museum is pleased on this historic evening to launch the James Baldwin Circle. Each year moving forward, an African American Pacific Northwest writer will be inducted into the James Baldwin Circle and they will become a fellow. We honor African American writers who write the truth, speak the truth, publish the truth, expect the truth, demand the truth so that we can all be better. And tonight, we honor, celebrate, and salute Marcus Harrison Green, and we are delighted to present him with this plaque. Let us all congratulate Marcus Harrison Green. The plaque reads, James Baldwin Circle Fellow Induction, Marcus Harrison Green. We celebrate your dedication and continuous fight for justice and equity in the Pacific Northwest. We honor you because you use the power of the pen to make America more equitable and you write in truth telling ways akin to James Baldwin. Congratulations to Marcus Harrison Green. You'll hear from him shortly. The Northwest African American Museum is delighted on this day, January 25th, 2022, to, as the inaugural 
James Baldwin Circle Fellow. Let us all congratulate, salute, and celebrate Marcus Harrison Green. And as we celebrate Marcus Green, we are so pleased that Angelique M. Davis is tonight's moderator for this conversation. She is a professor of political science and African and African American studies at Seattle University. Her research concentrates on racial gaslighting, apologies and reparations, and the socio-legal construction of race, as well as the political representation of non-white Americans and the reinvention of white supremacy in the 21st century. Her published articles are in several journals, including the Journal of Black Studies, the Black Scholar, and numerous others. She is in the process of writing a book entitled No Human Involved, Three-Fifths Justice in the United States. She received her Juris Doctor from the University of Washington in 1999. She served as a federal law clerk and subsequently practiced law until she joined the faculty at Seattle University in 2005. And in addition to her academic pursuits, Professor Davis serves as a commissioner on the Seattle Civil Service Commission. She owns Exhale Academic Writing Retreats and is a coach and campus workshop facilitator for the National Center for Faculty Development and Diversity. We are so honored to have Professor Davis as tonight's moderator. Now you all will have an opportunity to engage in tonight's conversation between Professor Davis and our honoree writer extraordinaire Marcus Harrison Green. So prepare to place your thoughts, your questions, and your comments in the chat. Enjoy and I present now Professor Angelique M. Davis. Thank you, Lanisha, for the wonderful introduction. And as I get started, I want to say thank you to Marcus for asking me to moderate this event and to Nam for recognizing Marcus. Um, I always look forward to conversations with Marcus and can't think of a more deserving person to, re uh, to receive the honor of being named the inaugural James Baldwin Circle Fellow. So first, let me introduce Marcus. I'm going to share his short, um, short but very full bio, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about his book. And as I told Marcus, I don't think that the bio that he's written about himself does him justice, and we're going to be talking about that today. But he is a publisher, as we know, of the South Seattle Emerald, as Lanisha talked about, a columnist with the Seattle Times. Uh, growing up in South Seattle, he experienced firsthand the impact of one-dimensional stories on marginalized communities, which taught him the value of authentic narratives. After an unfulfilling stint in the investment world during his 20s, Marcus returned to his community with a newfound purpose of telling stories with nuance, complexity, and multidimensionality with the hope of advancing social change. This led him to become the founder of the South Seattle Emerald. He was also awarded the Seattle Human Rights Commission's Individual Human Rights Leader Award for 2020. I'd also like to add that for those of us who know Marcus, um, and know what a committed community member he is. We also know just how down to earth he is um, and just overall uh, warm and engaging person. And like many, I got to know Marcus through friends in the community and community work. We quickly bonded over our love of writing, that we're both introverts whose idea of a great time is being alone for days, writing and researching and reading. And of course, we share the bond of being born and raised in the Pacific Northwest. And as you know, Marcus is from Seattle. I um, am originally from Tacoma, but still being Native Northwesterners and Black Native Northwesterners at that. You know, one of James Baldwin's very famous quotes is, quote, to be a Negro in this country and to be relatively conscious is to be in a rage almost all the time, end quote. So, you know, as Marcus wrote in his book, he is angry and he has no apologies for that. And this anger and how he has used it to be a truth teller, as Lanisha was talking about in this book, 
just completely stands out on every page. Um, in this book, he talks about his personal evolution into owning this rage and turning that energy into something constructive and into action. I want to say up front that we will touch on some difficult subjects. So I want to make sure to highlight that we're going to be talking about many different topics that I'll cover in a moment with some of the themes, including mental illness, suicide, and murder. Um, he, in this book, includes 30 essays that were written over about eight years that were included in at least five different publications um, and several uh, speeches as well that he's done. When you read this book, his language is powerful in its simplicity at times and also in its eloquence um, and just beautiful crafting of language. Um, as I read the book and I've read through it numerous times, I just consistently found myself going back to linger over parts of the wording that he used. And so he'll have, we'll have a chance to hear him read portions of this. Um, but for example, even in his opening essay, The March to the Mountaintop, Marcus wrote, and it was very simple but profound, that we can live in the world we were born into or we can live in the world as it can be. And so really invoking the idea of the imagination and the black imagination for what this world can be. Many of the themes in his book, he covers many themes. I'm going to highlight a few of them, right? Some um, of course focus on, he focuses on community, um, he talks about mental health and particularly blackness and mental health. He touches on policing. Of course, race and racism is central to everything that he's written here. And then he talks about the nuances of cynicism and how can we find meaning in a life where it seems like things are constantly happening um, that um, like the world is just constantly on fire. He talks about being black in America, but also the unique nature of um, racism in the Pacific, Pacific Northwest, our unique flavor that we have here. Touches on gentrification, family, and how allyship continues to evolve. So what I want to say is ultimately what makes this book so powerful is, you know, of course, his insights that we're going to hear about, but he talks about how easy it is to fall into the abyss of cynicism, yet he still finds ways to encourage us to find meaning and translate that into action. So at this point, um, I'd like to go ahead and welcome Marcus. He has a few remarks that he'd like to share, and then we'll get into our conversation about his book. Hello, Marcus. Yeah, yeah. Hello, Hello, Professor Davis. It is always a pleasure to be with you. Um, well, let me uh, and thank you, everybody, for uh, viewing and, and participating and, and being a part of this event. Um, thank you to NAM uh, for this recognition. Uh, I have to admit that I am <laughs> just extremely overwhelmed at this moment. Um, you know, I thought at this stage in the event I'd be beyond the point of believing that uh, someone was playing a cruel practical joke on me um, and I'd get a few seconds into my remarks and someone would, would yell psych you know um, but apparently that is uh, not going to be the case um, look for, for any writer at least for any writer whom I respect it's hard to fathom that you're deserving of being mentioned in the same universe let alone the same breath as James Baldwin forget black Jesus the man is just Jesus to me <laughs> and so I find myself overcome with gratitude today to Nam for this phenomenal recognition, but also to the community that has made me the writer and the person that I am today. It is such a strange irony to receive individual recognition when so many people have contributed to the nouns and verbs of the story of my life. There is no self-made person. There are only community made people forged and sharpened by a multitude and profoundness of the connections and interactions that we experience in life. I've been so, so fortunate to be the product of all the people who I've come across in my home of South Seattle. During my time as a writer, given the nature of my work, I've been attacked with racial slurs. I've been told 
that I was a terrible writer and was wasting everybody's time. Uh, when I was first starting out, uh, I was told that all the best that I could hope for was to become some insignificant blogger. Um, but throughout all that denunciation, it was the people right here in my home of South Seattle who believed in me, who encouraged me and told me to continue to endure in the arena of writing and truth telling. I endured because of my parents, Philip and Cynthia Green, who I thank today for working two jobs to afford my education and who welcomed me back into their home at a time when they were dreaming of an empty nest in order to support my dream of being a writer and a publisher. When fear and self-doubt threatened nearly uh, threatened to nearly make me quit writing, I endured because of my brothers and sisters, Antonio, John, Demarcus, Latanya, Jasmine, and my aunt and uncles, Donna, Yvette, Debbie, Nolan, and Gary. When I was crushed by depression and struggling with mental illness, I endured because of friends like Crystal Paul and Reagan Jackson and Devin Chikras and Tyrone Beeson and Vernal Coleman and Mason Bryan and Mark Bumgarden and Sonia Green Ayers and Georgia McDade and Michelle Matassa Flores and Sharon Maeda and Jerry Large and Lola Peters and Ben Hunter and Rachel Tift and Ijeoma Luo and Michael Charles and Sean Good and Mary Flowers and Lola Peters and Stephen Miller and Enrique Cerna and Derek Willer Smith and Barbara Golden and John Hillmeyer and Ann Althauser and Sharon Ho Chang and Jesse McKenna and Marty McKenna and Megan Christie and Carolyn Bick and Phil Manzano and Aaron Buckhalder and Matt Aspen and so, so many others. I'm sorry that I don't have the time to get to everybody, but I would promise to do so individually. But there have been so many people that when the world seems consumed by a rageful blaze, those are the folks that remind me that though the world may be on fire, my voice is not lost. But I'll say, without James Baldwin's influence and impact, there would have been very little to endure because he is this spark that ignited my passion for writing. I remember being an 11 year old boy sitting with my grandmother and watching an old interview of Baldwin where he shared his reasons for writing. I'm paraphrasing a bit here, but he said he wrote so that someday someone on a quest to know that their life was consequential, on a quest to know that their life wasn't doomed to perpetual midnights and that though they'd been deliberately shadowed from society's purview, that there existed a lantern of light by which they were seen, heard, and cherished. His words were that lantern, a guide through pulverizing alienation, soul mangling heartbreak, and pain that leaves you questioning whether or not to proceed with life. It's been his words that have illuminated for me the roads by which we find triumphs, the warmth of self-love, and an imagination pregnant with possibilities of a world superior to our current one. It's been his words and his life that have shown me that a hero is someone who believes themselves unworthy of such an intimidating title, but who also accepts the responsibility that comes with that title to live and serve in a way that unearths the community forming power found in solidarity scribes an alternative narrative to all the troubling fictions we collectively accept about our nation and reveals that not yet is not the same as the word never. I uh, certainly feel unworthy of this award, but I will do all I can to accept the responsibility of it. So thank you again to the Northwest African American Museum, to my family, the community of South Seattle uh, and everyone viewing this event today. Thank you. Thank you, Marcus. So good to be here with you today. So as we get started talking about your book, um, I wanted to just ask you, you know, to start with your roots. You were born and raised in South Seattle. Um, you know, you've lived here um, for a long time and you talk in your book quite a bit about how you've seen Ch uh, Seattle change throughout your lifetime. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how you capture that in, in your book, just kind of at a, a you know, broader um, level, and particularly how you've seen, you know, racism and in many ways kind of change South Seattle. 
Yeah, um, well, you know, proudly born in South Seattle, um, you know, lived in Rainier Beach and, and Skyway for the majority of my life. Um, and, you know, obviously there's uh, been quite a, uh, a change in uh, <laughs> the complexion, uh, literally and figuratively, uh, of the area. Uh, I think, uh, I, I think what has, you know, stood out most to me um, has just been the fact that, um, or trying to put, I guess, somewhat of a positive spin on it, it has been the fact that um, so many of the community that that was in terms of, uh, you know, historically in this you know, geographic location, um, so many of us have done our, our best to sort of truly live out the, the fact that community is, is a people and not necessarily a place, right? Um, it's unfortunate that we have to, to do that because of displacement and gentrification and the lack of um, housing affordability. But um, it shows you as well that in some ways the defiance of the circumstance, right? The fact that we are um, in the midst of all that, still uh, attempting to you know keep the strands of our community alive, whether that's you know various pop-ups that, that happen across the city, whether that's um, uh, you know people you know supporting our, our black businesses and our and our museums and our writers. And it, it seems like in some ways, you know, the worse that gentrification and displacement gets, it many times um, uh, a I don't want to say a benefit or silver lining, but it's a reaction to that has has been in, in many ways to try to strengthen what we do have here, even if that means you know driving all the way from Kent to go to Langston um, and, and catch a show, or to rent out um, the Arc Lodge Cinema over in uh, you know Columbia City for you know Black Panther, and and it's right, literally right. a blackout night uh, <laughs> in Columbia City. So yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you. I mean, we're going to delve into this much deeper. You talk a lot about family as well, um, and, and we'll get into some of that. But I was thinking that, um, you know, one of the things in just talking about your evolution as a writer, um, clearly James Baldwin was very influential, but you weren't always your career path for a period of time. You were in the finance industry, correct? Um, I was, yeah. Yeah, and so you made the transition. Could you talk a little bit about what had you transition from that? I mean, clearly, um, I'm guessing finance pays a little differently than uh, being a writer, um, but you made this this commitment because it seems like you really had this, you know, deep, you could call it a calling or whatever, but desire to, to do this uh, work. So could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I, I mean, it... And to your point, uh, certainly finance was a lot more lucrative than uh, writing, <laughs> um, you know, unless you're you know, perennially on the, the bestseller list like John Grisham or something. Um, but uh, all, you know, all that glitters isn't gold. And it took me a while to, to understand that, you know, I was in a you know, nice situation uh, living in California at the time. Um, but I started to feel a, a void and, a, and an emptiness and um, just a, a, you know, right now everybody's sort of going through this great uh, re-examination, a great re-examination or great uh, reassessment of what they want to do in life. And for me, that, that kind of came, you know, in a period where I was like, do, what do I actually want to do with, with my life? What do you know, if I extrapolate my life out and um, let's say I'm 90 or 100 years old, um, hopefully I can live that long. And I'm asking, how did I spend my days? And what did I spend my days doing? You know, what did I contribute, um, you know, to this world? What did I, um, you know, what did I, how did I truly use my voice and my gifts and so forth? And the thing that I kept coming back to was that I didn't want to go to the grave with music still inside me, so to speak. You know, I didn't want to go to the grave knowing that I could have said or done something that uh, was impactful in, in life and that I solely just lived a life that was truly all about self-interest. Um, you know, I wanted to do something that made me truly feel alive in life. And for me, that has always been, you know, writing, storytelling, um, you know, trying to capture other people's stories, trying to, to bring stories to life. 
um, trying to make honestly <laughs> people care uh, about folks who um, normally um, don't get any consideration uh, and are largely ignored in our society. Um, and so for me, uh, you know, it's as silly as it, it sounded at the time when people were like, you're giving up a, a nice job in finance to what? To, <laughs> to write where there is no, um, you know, there, there is no, uh, uh, you know, there, there's no guarantee of success. There's, and, you know, it's a high probability as a matter of fact that, you know, you won't um, succeed. You don't have a journalism degree. You don't have an English degree. Um, you know, you're, what are you doing, you know, in, in changing your career? And yet for me, um, I know that I would have, as long as I've waited to switch over to that career, uh, I know, uh, you know, I, I didn't do it soon enough, um, so to speak. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm certainly happy where I'm, where I'm at in my life. Uh, you know, and I just, and just to let people know this, this background is a fake background. This is not my actual, you know, palatial estate or anything. So. Well, um, you know, I think what you're talking about too is, you know, there's so many different ways that we can think of or conceive of wealth, right? And, um, but, you know, the, in, the investment that you've made in South Seattle and our community in truth telling, um, in elevating people's stories, um, you know, I think it's just so powerful um, when we see people who are really listening to, um, what they really feel called to do instead of what they feel like society is telling them they should do. And so just thank you for that. Um, you talk a lot about family. So we're talking about community, family, um, and there's some, a few stories that you share, um, kind of about coming up and then, um, in Seattle and especially some really powerful stories about your grandparents, um, so, you know, one um, that, you know, each generation I think has these different moments that are kind of um, moments where we all remember where we were or what we were thinking, right? So for my parents' generation, right, one of the things they remember is Kennedy's assassination, for example, right? A lot of people remember when they heard that. For many of us, it's 9-11. And for many of us, um, particularly Black Americans, is when Obama was elected president. Right. Right. And you talk about your grandfather, um, Jimmy Green, and his um, your discussion with him surrounding the election. And that's really in your opening essay. And I was wondering if you wouldn't mind reading um, a bit of that essay for us. I mean, it was just so powerful hearing that conversation. And um, I think in so many ways, you know, is about your family, but in also in many ways is about so many um, other black families. So it reminded me of the types of things that many um, of my other relatives and elders have also said. So if you wouldn't mind sharing part of that essay for us. All right. Um, let me go to it. Yeah. My grandfather, Jimmy Green, was not an emotional man. Growing up, I never once believed he was capable of shedding a tear. But that day, the, uh, when Barack Obama was inaugurated, he couldn't help but be overcome with joy. The type of joy that only comes when you finally see something for so long you've been told is impossible. And so I asked him, I asked this man who had grown up a sharecropper in a segregated Arkansas, who because of the laws at that time was forbidden from going beyond an eighth grade education, who had been called boy so long it took him until his late twenties to fully believe he was a man, who wasn't allowed to fight for this country in a segregated military, but was allowed to cook for the soldiers who did, and who couldn't cast a vote for president until he was 35. Asked my grandfather if he ever thought a man who looked like the one he voted for that November could ever become president. No, he answered, no. I never ever dreamed a day like this was possible. But Marcus, he cautioned, be careful because as good of a day as this is, it's just one and we need many more. We still have higher to rise. That's the last thing he ever told me. Later that night, he fell into a coma and passed away having seen the impossible. Um, yeah, uh, I, I tell you, it's, uh, I actually thought 
about him uh, not too long ago, uh, a year, a little over a year ago, January 6th, I was, I was thinking about, you know, his words and about how much we needed uh, more days like the one that he had, or even better days, I should say, like, than the one, uh, than his last day that, that he was conscious on earth. Um, and also just the fact that I was glad that he didn't <laughs> have to see um, that particular day on, on January 6th as well. Um, yeah, so, so for me to be able to share that, to be able to share that history and pass that on, um, mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's, it's moments like that um, that I say that I am glad for, uh, that I, I knew even you know, early on, and that was, that was written early on in my writing career, I was glad that um, you know, I had that moment with him and, I, and, and that in many ways reaffirmed uh, that I'd made the right decision in, in being a writer. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's just so powerful. And then, you know, the fact that he went into coma and passed um, right yeah. after having been able to see that and share that. You know, you also write about your grandmother. Um, and, you know, I think um, in so many ways that essay and talking about how your family shared care giving um, for your grandmother, who'd always been the strong one and taking care of everyone in the family, it sounds like, or at least particularly you. But then you all shared the caregiving responsibilities near the end of her life and um, how real you were about that. It, it really made me think a lot about how so many of our families, um, we don't send our parents or grandparents to homes, right? We do that um, caretaking ourselves um, and the joy that it is, but also how difficult it is too at the same time. But you also shared uh, moments about how um, as a child, you know, how she was your hero. And you share one particularly striking story um, about a little uh, thing that had happened, skirmish, it sounded like <laughs> in the neighborhood. Um, I was wondering, I know it's, um, in your essay, When Your Only Hero Falls. Um, if you could share a part of that essay with us too. Um, I know, I think it was page 62, where you start talking about um, how when you were nine years old, and having a nine-year-old daughter myself uh, right now, uh, it, it brought a smile to my face and um, really made sense why she was so much your hero. Well, you do remind me a lot of my grandmother, I'll say, especially oh, my. I'll read <laughs> in a very good way, obviously. Um, <laughs> uh, I'll pick up as uh, it's this woman who, when I was nine years old, stopped in the middle of cooking dinner to calmly load her shotgun as if it was her garden seed dispenser to protect the grandson who had just blown into our house to hide from gang members who had been terrorizing the neighborhood. They were non-discriminatory in putting young and old alike in the hospital. While everyone else locked their door, she walked from hers, her flowery apron accessorized by a double barrel and announced she would kill every last one of you mother effers if you dare lay a finger on my grandson's head. With my heart racing and hers at a mellow beat, she returned to fixing supper while my pursuers made themselves scarce and asked, are you hungry? <laughs> yeah, that's, um, yeah, I, I'll say, I mean, I know that the sort of the trope of the strong black woman is, is one that uh, can be very problematic at, at times, right? Because it's always like, well, hell, I, I wouldn't have to be so strong if <laughs> this world was actually equitable and fair. But um, for my grandmother, uh, you know, she was just, uh, a force of nature and, and just somebody who um, and talk about somebody who, you know, she grew up in Texas and having to survive, you know, the very sort of explicit racism there at times. And then, you know, move to a place like the Pacific Northwest with um, not so explicit, but still, <laughs> um, you know, uh, racism um, here uh, when she did come and, and migrate up here. Um, you know, she was somebody who never allowed circumstance to 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 crush her and um and always like it was somebody who i think i learned you know how to continue to keep dignity in in the face of whatever uh, might come your way from her i mean that was really what her life's message was to me um is yeah. that um you know I, even as things um 
even as we fight for a better world and so forth, knowing that we still live in this one that we have, how do we, how are we able to keep our, our dignity and our self-respect? And there was never a time that um, her dignity or self-respect ever wavered. And there's never a time that she would uh, go into a situation or, or, or speak with somebody and, um, you know, she switched codes and, and algorithms or whatever it is. Um, she was just always herself. And there was just always, and, and yeah, I mean, that might have cost her at, at times professionally, but it also just provided a great example to her children and her grandchildren um, that ultimately, uh, you know, no one can take away your dignity if you do not allow them to. <coughs> Excuse me. You also um, mentioned, Marcus, how she liked to greet the day each day. And I was wondering if you could, and then later how she would always wake up. <coughs> Excuse me, but then how in her final days you were also able to assist her with that, that she would insist she could do it herself. Yeah. Um, um, I was wondering if I, you could either talk maybe a little bit about that or if you wanted to, to share a passage about that. But it really struck me when you were talking about, you know, um, kind of this almost trope we have, right, of the, the strong Black woman that, um, but really, right, many people fail to do a deeper, more critical analysis of of that. And I, I really appreciated how you showed her vulnerability as well. Um, and the, you know, mutual support of family. Um, so yeah. sorry if you could talk a little bit about that. Yeah, well, I'll say, um, you know, my, uh, my grandmother was always, uh, you know, because she was, uh, she said, you know, a, a southerner through and through, um, at least uh, in, in terms of how she treated people, she would always say, you know, she was raising me to be a gentleman. And she said, um, Marcus, it, it takes uh, it, it takes a strong person to be a gentleman, meaning that it takes a strong person to be vulnerable. Um, and I really didn't see that in my grandmother until, um, you know, towards the end of her life when, um, you know, couldn't really help it. <laughs> and, you know, and we were in the same, living under the same roof. Um, so I'll... Uh, I guess I'll, I'll read this passage um, here. It says, it was her demeanor that seemed to feed so generously into the juvenile notion that we have our heroes. They are infallible and therefore incapable of hurting to the levels the rest of us do. It's impossible for them to be like us, to be weak, to fall, because then who would we have to lean on? Who else would cushion our descents? But fallen, sprawled on the carpet with her limbs contorted in all but the most unnatural positions is where I would find my grandmother most days. I'd pick her up, her delicate body, and deposit it back into her bed. But I'd always be halted by the fragile pleading of, please, just let me stand to see it. She would say this as her eyes caught a peep of the first rays of the sun that inaugurated the day. It was a small victory to defy her condition by continuing the habitual practice she had done every day of her life. Look at no longer do on her own. It was amazing to see how everything else can wither away in a human being. The mind eroded by time and dementia, the body crippled by disease, but the spirit, the will to live, to let life know it still has to account for you despite its stern dealings can be so resilient as to never wane. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's, you know, I mean, to me, uh, to me, you know, she, yeah, I mean, she just continues to be a personal hero. Um, yeah. You know, we, we, I think, live in a society that sort of lionizes folks um, like the, you know, the billionaires of the world and the Elon Musk and sports figures and so forth. But to be able to see people who have very limited advantages in life to, to and almost no advantages in life and yet still um, strive to um, be accounted for in, in this life um, to, to still um, you know live a life that is worthy of um, existence um, you know that's something that and it, that's an image of my grandmother that always stays with me. And there are times where I certainly have, 
get beat de- get have gotten beat it, beaten down so to speak or i am depressed and it's that image that keeps me alive and mm-hmm. um, keeps me going many times mm-hmm. yeah Absolutely. Thank you, Marcus. You know, talking about your grandparents, you also talk about your parents. And I'm thinking, um, you know, in several essays talking about your mother and what a central role she's played as well on both of your parents. Um, yeah, my dad's looking at this, so please say say both. Yes, of course I always, have to say that. I know, I like know. Your mom gets way too much credit. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> well, I, I wanted to... Um, you know, ask you a bit about, you know, your parents and some of what you've you've written and also tie that into your discussion regarding mental health. Um, You know, one of your essays, you talk about, you know, talking to your mom, it was a rough day and she'd had a really difficult um, day with the work that she was doing and all of the things that had happened right that day. Um, And then kind of responding, you know, to that, how you, you chose to respond. But I, you know, you also talked about just um, kind of your own personal um, worldview and view on spirituality and um, being agnostic. I think that's really important to discuss. Um, and, but also how your mom is, a, it sounded like from the essay as a believer um, as well. And so, But you talked a lot about how, you know, much of a role she's played for you in your journey with mental health. And I was wondering if you could maybe talk a little bit um, about that as well. Yeah. So uh, for for those who don't know, um, I have I was diagnosed with bipolar disorder. Um, And so it's it's something that I I live with on a day to day basis. There is. there's no cure for it, at least not right now, but there is a, uh, you know, management of it. Um, you know, for those who don't know, it, it's it's an inability uh, essentially to um, regulate, you know, your, your mood swings and um, sometimes leads to very erratic, excuse me, erratic behavior and um, can lead to, um, uh, you know, neurosis and, and, and various other things and so it's you know something that i've struggled with for a while and um there were times you know early on uh when i didn't want to accept the diagnosis um earlier in my life that you know i would certainly um you know did what many people do and then that's you know try to self-medicate um with things to sort of bury uh the pain and and, and bury um you know uh, acceptance of, of the truth and it um, really wasn't until, um, you know, I, I take a, a good accounting of my life and, and knowing that um, my behavior and the fact that I wasn't seeking treatment um, was leading to, you know, hurt and, and um, disappointment in a lot of people who I was close to. Um, there's still, you know, some friendships that uh, have, you know, never been mended, um, you know, from that time period. And, um, for me, I realized that, uh, you know, in, consult- in consultation with my mom and my dad, it wasn't that I was seeking treatment for, you know, for other people as much as I was seeking it for myself, right? In trying to find um, love for myself and knowing, and in knowing and discovering what love was for myself, you know, that's how I was able to know how to actually love other people. Um, and uh, it's, you know, continues to be a journey, uh, to be honest with you there, you know, there's some days where <laughs> it's just a victory to wake up and, and greet the sun every morning. But again, sort of going back to my grandmother, sometimes that's just enough. Right. Um, and so, uh, you know, for me, it's, uh, it's a journey that I'm on and, and a journey that I continue to be very open about to try to hopefully help people who are, um, you know, in, um, in my situation, uh, especially as, to be honest with you, especially as, as a, uh, as a black male, I, I'll just be real. It's, it's a lot of times where, um, because of what the, the, you know, because of the narratives around of what it is to, um, quote unquote, be, uh, uh, it, you know, what it means to be a man, quote unquote, um, which is, can still be problematic. There are a lot of people who don't 
want to come to the fore and forefront and be accepting of the fact um, you know, that they are having mental um, health struggles. And so I kind of, in many ways, want to live a life that showcases that, yeah, I mean, it's it's not easy, but it is manageable and it is okay. It is okay to um, accept uh, what's going on with yourself. Yeah, thank you. I, I briefly want to say we're about five minutes before Q&A. We have 25 minutes for Q&A, so we'll be able to unpack a lot more things. Um, so for those in the audience, as we're wrapping um, up this portion of the conversation, we'll be continuing to go. If you have questions, if you could please put them in the chat um, right now, we'll be able, we'll do our best to get to as many as we can. Um, so I want to go ahead and um, ask you to do that. Um, so Marcus, you know, you talk also about what allyship um, means and how it continues to evolve. Um, I was wondering if you could touch on a little bit on what you've written about that and your observations through the work you've been doing. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I, I'll say I think I've moved from uh, sort of uh, the word allyship, if you will, to, um, and I know it's more popular to say co conspirators, um, meaning that there is. You know, you are um, just as, you know, complicit <laughs> um, in a situation as, as someone else. Um, you know, I, I know that there's been a lot of conversations around, um, you know, post 2020 after the murder of George Floyd, when you had all these great proclamations that people were making and, you know, we're going to do better and we haven't done um, um, X, Y, and Z in the past, but we'll make sure to do it. And then when it's time to sort of settle accounts now that the two years has passed, right? You realize how, you know, little, in some way, in, in some places, little staying power some of those <laughs> proclamations have had. Um, and that it, in many ways, it has gone back to business as, as usual. And I think what I've seen many times, and not to pick on my hometown of Seattle, but, but very much, in Seattle at, at times where you have seen, where I've seen it, or at least observed, where, you know, people are fine with the sort of the, the marketing, our, our kabuki theater, if you will, of, yeah, no, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm down with these causes and I'm all for um, Black and, and, and uh, LGBTQIA plus liberation and so on and so forth. And yet, right, when it comes to where the rubber meets the road, um, when they actually have to sacrifice something more than words, and and the and the you know the music doesn't actually match up with the words many times and so it's you know to me you know you have to have a level of willingness to you know yeah there is a level of sacrifice but there's also a layer a level of collaboration and sharing right um, you know not to over romanticize um, certain periods in our history but you know as as I always point back to there's you know the, there's not one formerly enslaved person, right, who voted for the 14th Amendment. There's not one woman who voted for the 19th Amendment to end, um, you know, uh, in terms of, uh, you know, women's suffrage. And so it's, there is, you know, there has to be people in order for us, right, to advance as a society, there has to be people who say that I'm willing to dilute um, some of my power, some, you know, that has, that has kind of in many ways come to us, uh, you know, unnaturally by the way that, you know, society is structured. I'm willing to do that so that the whole of us, the all of us um, can do a, a little bit better. Um, and that is something that doesn't, it isn't, you know, going to ever be reduced to some marketing slogan or, you know, 180 or 260 characters or whatever it is on Twitter. That That's something that has to be done consistently over time, sometimes out of the shadows, right? Um, and, you know, sometimes that's just work that you have to do you know, with your, yourself and, and as clumsy as you might be doing it, um, you know, being willing to fall on your face and get back up. Um, you know, so for me, and, and I say that as somebody, right, who is, I'm only going to ever be an imperfect co-conspirator, uh, ally, however you want to say it, to, um, you know, my kids and the LGBTQIA plus community, um, to my other folks. And so it's in terms of male allyship or male co-conspiratorship. Um, and so, you know, I know it is hard, you know, I, kn I know that there are times that you, I, you know, I stumble all the time 
but it's you know being it's having that willingness and that humility and um to accept that um and to try to make new mistakes um you know as we as we push forward oh looks looks like you're uh looks like you're muted professor davis thank you um so i have one more question before we get to the questions and answers um you know you talk a lot about cynicism and um finding purpose and meaning despite you know so many terrible things happening in this world and i was wondering if you could maybe talk about um you know kind of how you've could continue to do the work right this is yeah. not easy work um and you know on top of it you know this has come um right for everyone comes at a great cost and this for you has also had great personal cost um so how do you avoid being cynical um and keep going yeah um that's a good question I, to me i think it's the just embracing the reality of why things are the way they are right um you know as somebody who as you pointed out is agnostic it doesn't necessarily believe in um you know preordained destiny or that there's um any uh sort of outside forces that are that are moving um our world in some ways it's the onus then becomes to look at um our our own culpability right as, as humans how how we are have done each other right how we are continuing to do each other i was uh for instance i was just listening to uh, a podcast on the haitian revolution and it talked about um it it obviously talked about um the the liberation of the formerly enslaved people there and, and also though how when uh some some of them who were fighting uh, for liberation in many ways became uh just as bad <laughs> as uh those who had a uh, those who had been oppressing them and and what you know and, and what the message was for me is that ultimately all these structures that we have and all these systems that we have and the treatment of each other right it's create it's not magic right it's cre been created and handed down by human beings and so then that means it can be undone and dismantled and replaced by human beings. I'm, I'm not saying that that is going to be easy. It isn't. And many times there are years and decades and, uh, you know, uh, epochs uh, pass without any, you know, change happening. But it's the fact that we have to continue to create ripples in life, right? We have to continue to create sparks of, uh, of light in darkness. I think it's um, the comedian Dick Gregory who talks about that no matter how much darkness there is, that even a spark of light is noticeable because it is so dark, right? Um, and so for us, we have to continue to, to, to be that at, at times, even when our ideas or the things we're writing about or the injustices we are trying to um, showcase are, are out of favor or aren't popular, you just have to continue to. And so for me, I don't want to, you know, as, as Baldwin said, he's an optimist because he because <laughs> he woke up, um, this, you know, in, this morning, um, you know, so for, for me, you know, I have this day, I have tomorrow, hopefully, uh, to do some work towards creating, you know, some flickers uh, of light in this world. And sometimes it just has to be enough. And, and it is for me for right now. Thank you. Well, Marcus, as always, I could just go on for hours talking to you, and hopefully we'll get a chance to do that sometime again soon. Um, there's so much more in this book, so I just really encourage people to read it. Just so many more themes that we just couldn't possibly get to today. Let's go ahead and start taking some of the questions um, from the audience. Um, so let me just start going through some of the ones that um, people have asked. So. One of the questions is, where did you go to high school and uh, what year did you graduate? <laughs> so I went to high school at Kennedy Catholic in Burien. It was, I think it was called Kennedy Prep at that time. Um, and I graduated in what would have been uh, the year 2000. Okay, thank you. And one of the other questions is, what's next for you? Yeah. Um, well, I'm working on a couple of different projects right now. Um, working one is a musical that hopefully 
um me and my uh co-conspirator on that ben hunter uh will finally get off the ground i just wanted to make sure to put it out there so that i can keep us both accountable and getting this musical out here and um I'm also, <laughs> I've been tasked with working on a, a treatment for a uh, potential Netflix show. Um, and then working on a, a, a book uh, right now with, a, with someone who wants me to help tell their story and I've agreed to do that. So um, hopefully a, a lot more writing. Um, obviously I will, I will continue to be supportive uh, of the Emerald, just, just not as much into the, the day to day. Um, but um yeah i won't i won't be leaving the emerald entirely okay all right one of the other questions that came um was that someone commented that you know in talking to you and i know this from our conversations that you often um have various quotes you, you know um that you'll bring up in conversation <laughs> and and so the question is what is your favorite quote and why Oh man, that's that's asking who your favorite you know child is. Um, I, I think it just I think it depends on the scenario. Um, huh? I uh, yeah. Um, you know, obviously, essentially anything by by Baldwin is usually great. Um, you know, Toni Morrison, Audre Lorde. Uh, yeah, gosh, it is hard. I I don't know about my favorite quote, but um, I, I, I'd say like a, a quote that I recently came across that has been, um, uh, that has been on my mind for a little bit um, is one from Tony Morrison. Uh, let me actually bring it up here. It's, yeah, it's, it's actually from Beloved and she says, freeing yourself was one thing, claiming ownership of that freed self was another. Mm. Um, and, you know, for me, I, I, I think that stands out because it's right. It, it, in, in this society, we, we have a tendency to many times have a, a hive mentality or, or fall into conformity, um, but truly being who we are as, as unique individuals, I mean, that truly truly is you know a, a gift and the privilege of a lifetime that i hope all of us can have thank you so much we have several more questions so we'll get through as many as we can um so one of the other questions is could you speak a bit on what songs you have inside you that are yet unsung <laughs> well, you did talk about some of your future projects but i don't know if there's anything else you'd want to add yeah, um, you know, I still want to do, uh, you know, uh, I still have no various novels and plays and, and screenplays within me. Um, you know, I do want to, uh, honestly, the, one of the reasons why I was listening to the Revolutions podcast was, um, you know, I, I do want to do a, a series of um, sci-fi realism, um, you know, books on, you know, revolution and, and what it what it truly takes. I think there's so often that we have these dystopian novels that everything is crushed, um, you know, down by the end of the, the book or, or the series. And yet there's never really, uh, other than an epilogue here and there, there's never really um, uh, an examination of what does it take to create, um, you know, the world in which we want to live in, right? I, you have everything, you know, and the, the more I learn about revolutions and, and it seems like everybody wants one is that, um, you know, there's no, there's no certainty, right? That what the revolution produces necessarily will be better than, than what became before. And, and I, you know, I, so I want to write something that essentially um, is that the message is that, you know, what is the intentionality we have about this world that we are trying to create? How do, how do we make sure that we're not replicating the same system, the same mode of behavior, right? That led us to, you know, to this path in the first place. Um, that was actually one of the things in, in studying the Haitian Revolution, where uh, I think to Saint um, Louverture, who sort of in in, um, uh, hey, in Haitian history is sort of become known as uh, one of the great liberators. And yet, you know, he was somebody who wanted to be essentially king for life and continue with the plantation <laughs> economy. Um, 
So, uh, you know, how do we truly, how, how do we truly, you know, move forward towards a system and a world where it, is, it isn't just rearranging the deck chairs in terms of who is, you know, who is in control, but, you know, what is, you know, how do we create a system that is, that is truly, you know, one that is liberatory, li li ah, <laughs> equitable and, and is, you know, teams with liberation. Mm, yeah, absolutely. Thank you. You know, the next question, um, I want to preface it a little bit, you know, in your book, you talk about um, this concept of, of our um, being oppressed, right? But also mm -hmm. us, our ability to oppress others as well, right? right? And then our intersecting identities, right? So the concept of intersectionality and how we have many multiple, you know, multiple intersecting identities that um, we all live with. And you also talk about racism, not just with black people in the Pacific Northwest, but also you talk about reparations um, for the first inhabitants of this land, um, and specifically talking about some things that are happening here regarding Native American um, um, and discussions and regarding that you talk about um, you know, particularly in your essay, and I, I want to get to that, touch on that before we close about Kubota Gardens and this concept of home, but how you also are always recognizing Japanese American incarceration when you're there and, you know, in many ways recognizing our linked fates as well. Right. And so, you know, this question is that would you return to the topic of how you'd characterize racism in the Seattle area and what you have found effective in getting beneath the surface. Yeah, um, I, I think I would categorize it as, as what we've sort of become known for in terms of passive aggressive, right? It's, I'll say this, right? I think we are in Seattle are okay with um, having the veneer, right? Of progressivism and uh, multiculturalism and so forth, right? In the sense of like, we're okay, you know, putting somebody in a prominent place um, as I say, right, a, a black, <laughs> a black face in a high place, right? What we aren't mostly okay with is what we aren't okay with most of the time, I should say, is allowing that person, right, to be fully themselves, allowing that person to have true power, right? Um, you know, uh, allowing a person, allowing a person right right access as well to to power and, and, and resource and resources in a way that will shake things up a bit I um, you know I remember talking to a friend uh, who was I won't name the company or the person but um, <laughs> who was uh, up for a job in a very prominent um, company here um, in that Seattle based and um, you know the feedback that he got from somebody who was, uh, you know, on the hiring committee um, was basically was like, "Well, we kind of want to know uh, that you're you're uh, controllable," <laughs> and um, you know, I think that's like sort of where you know that's that's kind of where the racism kind of rears its head here, right? It's not in the it's not in necessarily ostentatiousness. Um, and explicitness, it's in the, okay, who are we actually going to let into the halls of power? Who, who are we going to allow to actually be here? Um, who are we going to sort of pat on the back and say, ah, oh, you're, you're doing great, but we're not necessarily going to, you know, put you in um, mm -hmm. a position of management. We're not going to put you in a position of um, authority. We're not going to, we'll, we'll put you on billboards, um, you know, but we're not, we're not going to give you any actual power. And then when you after decades and, and decades of, of being sort of treated in a tokenistic fashion, right? You're, you know, when you sort of, you've just had enough <laughs> and you do come out and you say certain things, um, you know, I'm thinking of a particular doctor in our, uh, <laughs> um, uh, in Seattle, um, you know, they, you're, you're treated as if, and, and, you know, as if you were a commodity to have been um, discarded and disowned. And so, um, you know, I think that's, in some ways, right? I would rather somebody call me the N word to my face than pretend that everything is hunky dory. And yet, as you continue to get up to these various levels of attainment or achievement, um, you know, professionally, you're kind of, it's, it almost becomes a death by a thousand cuts, right? You're asked um, 
uh, to continue to make concession after concession after concession after concession. And then finally, you know, you've gotten to a place where it's like, you know, my goodness, right? What am, you know, maybe it's time to re-examine, um, you know, where I'm at in my life at this moment. Yeah. Yeah, I, your essay, um, I fear everyday encounters more than I do hate groups. Um, if readers haven't read that one yet, I really encourage them. I think it really, it really is, is um, I think talks a lot about particularly racism here in, in the Northwest. Um, so a couple more things um, to ask you that some more questions that have come in. Um, so could you tell us more about how you found your way into the writing world and the writing community? Right. Yeah. Um, so I guess I was about a late, like tw either 29 or 30 when I came back um, to Seattle uh, from uh, California. And at that time, you know, I, I knew that whatever I wanted to do it wasn't, uh, you know, back in finance or making rich people richer. Um, and a friend of mine asked, uh, you know, yeah, I, I told him I was kind of struggling with, you know, what that my next move was. And he said, uh, well, what's, you know, can you pinpoint a time in your life where you've been the most happy, um, you know, and that provides you get sort of, you know, sparks, perpetual sparks of happiness. And um, I, uh, I said, yeah, it's, you know, when I'm, when I'm writing, right. I mean, that's when I truly feel most alive. That's when I truly feel like I'm just free to be there and live there on the on the page. And um, so he said, "Well, why don't you, you know, try to get into the journalism or uh, or something like that?" And so, you know, obviously I didn't have a degree. I wasn't looking to go back to school <laughs> to get one either. Um, and so I pretty much just cold called everybody I respected um, as a as a journalist, as a storyteller, as a writer. You know, people like Jerry Large at the time. Um, Sarah Studeville, who was with the Seattle Globalist, um, Sonia Green Ayers, who was at KBCS 91.3 FM. And I just straight up asked them if they would mentor me. And all, I, I mentioned all those three in particular because they all said yes. There's some other people who never got back to me. Um, but those people, uh, you know, served as, you know, my primary source of, of education. Um, you know, and, and folks as well as, as Mark Baumgarten and, and Greg Hanscom, who, um, who told, who really, you know, let me know that I could do this. And I, I think it was in small moments where I remember when I was, I was the, I was on a fellowship at Yes Magazine and it was, um, I got to go to uh, a seminar for um, uh, writers of color who were opinion writers. And um, I remember the instructor there and I was, you know, I was just so, it was my second year in, in journalism and I was just so, um, you know, overcome by imposter syndrome. You had all these other people there who were some, you know, uh, were writing for the Atlantic and Forbes. And I was just this lowly uh, person, you know, from South Seattle. And yet I remember uh, one of the first uh, lessons that we had um, at this, or one of the first uh, sessions, I should say, that we had at the seminar, they brought up um, various writing samples and snippets from people who um, were there at the seminar. And the first one that they brought up was mine. And um, they were just like, wow, look at this. This is just a beautiful, beautiful, um, you know, syntax and, um, you know, very, you know, concise sentence here. And, um, you know, this writer is a wonderful writer. And, and that was really the first time where I was like, wow, I, I belong here. You know, it's, it's, it isn't just in, in my head. And, um, you know, and it's been, <laughs> full steam ahead ever since. So. Oh, Professor Davis, you still, you know. I did it again, I know. <laughs> um, thank you. Marcus, what would you like your readers to take away from this book? I think, uh, I'll say this, you know, I, uh, I've seen so much recently where people are sort of overcome by a sense of not necessarily apathy, but a, a sense of, of throwing up their hands um, that they have no efficacy to do anything or, or no agency to do anything. Um, and that sort of the world is going to, and this country is, is going to go in the direction it's going to go uh, via, uh, you know, e inertia. And so, you know, might as well just get on with the, um, 
the doomsday scenarios <laughs> uh, of this country. I, I think, but again, right, I, I think I want them to take away from this book is that, look, I mean, it might be a little something, but it is something that you can do. It is that we don't need to necessarily um, allow things to be as they are if we don't choose to do that, right? Um, there is, there is that there can be possibility, I should say. Not, not necessarily hope, but there can be possibility that something is different. Like whether it is on the individual level, the uh, communal level, the, the, the social level, international level, there are things that we can contribute to um, and, uh, you know, to make sure that we advance, again, the society that we wish to live in. And, and I think that is going to have to come with uh, commitment in many ways to solidarity, um, you know, and a communion of interests. That being said, I mean, I, <laughs> if <laughs> I, you know, I know that it is hard many times to organize, um, you know, community and, and organize those interests. It is hard, yes, but it is worth doing, um, and that we we have to do it, and and that would be what I, I if there was just the one thing that would be um, it. I, but if there was two things, <laughs> the other thing would be that hey, this life is there. I know that there is a lot that goes on in this life, and there is ugliness, and there is pain, and there is hardship. But there is also beauty. There is also splendor here. There is also these other things that we can find about this life. Um, and, you know, to, uh, as I say, you know, I, live a life that if you can, that, that at least once a day, you, we are able to, to take away some, some level of beauty, even in the worst of circumstances, you know, for ourselves. Thank you. Before we turn to close, um, your final essay, is titled Home is a Place Called Kubota Garden, and you talk about the meaning of home for you. I was wondering if you wouldn't mind reading a bit from that essay um, as we get ready to close out our discussion today. Um, that uh, I think really distills uh, your roots here in South Seattle, and um, just the, the imagery is very powerful. All right. Um, any particular uh, section in that? I know it's not the longest essay. No, I mean, I, I love it all. It's the <laughs> longest one, I, particularly the last part uh, where you talk about specifically home. Um, I think why home is the most powerful word um, okay. to you. All right. I'll, I'll split it up from a little bit of the beginning and a little bit of the end. And, uh, Perfect. and, and those who want the, the whole thing, they can buy the book. So. Um. <laughs> Throughout my life, Kubota Garden has epitomized the most powerful one-syllable word in the English language. And no, that word isn't love, as powerful as it is. That word is home. Because home, at least an ideal one, is where human love, peace, fortitude, and belonging are nurtured and absorbed. Home is a place that goes beyond just welcoming you. It accepts you for all you are, whatever you may be. You need no invitation to enter its safety and its refuge. Kubota Gardens founder endured racial discrimination, prison camps, and economic distress to produce and nurture magnificence. I remember that every time I visit the garden, whether I'm accompanied by joy, pain, sorrow, ardor, wonder, or awe, the garden calls to me just the same with an embrace of home it's a call resembling the Persian poet and Sufi mystic Rumi's verse. Come, come, whoever you are, wanderer, worshiper, lover of leaving, it doesn't matter. Ours is not a garden of despair. Come, even if you have broken your vows a thousand times, come yet again, come, come. And that is why home is the most powerful one syllable word in the English language, because home is a reminder of life's beauty endearment, dignity, and worth. Over these past few years, we've spent so much time, too much time, focused on the shadows cast by people who perpetuate hate and fear. We spent so little time on the sunbeams shown by people who spent their lives nurturing community and transmitting love through their life's work. Thank you so much, Marcus. 
Um, it's been just a, such a pleasure to be in conversation with you um, and just to be able to see your work elevated. Um, wish you the best. I encourage people if they haven't read the book already, go out and buy it, give it to your friends. Um, just such a powerful collection. Um, and so with this, we're going to turn it now back to Lanisha to do the closing. James Baldwin Circle Fellow, Marcus Harrison Green. Thank you, Marcus and Professor Davis for those words of wisdom about community, about ourselves, about our future. Marcus, you show us that none of us are alone, that we do everything we do in community with others. Thank you. That list of names of all the individuals who are receiving this award with you, powerful, powerful. Thank you. Thank you for sharing uh, that word of wisdom from your grandfather, Mr. Jimmy Green, who you said stated, as good of a day as this is, it's just one, and we need many more. Mm. And reminding us of the word home. Marcus, thank you. And congratulations to you and all of those in community with you. We are thrilled to hear about all of the projects that are ahead on your plate, Marcus. Thank you for sharing your light and for helping us all to become liberated. And thank you, Professor Davis, for such an insightful and vulnerable and powerful conversation. Thank you to the both of you. Congratulations, Marcus. Thank you. I, I have a feeling that I'll be interviewing uh, Angelique here, you know, in the next couple of years and, and, and she'll be getting this award. So anyhow, yeah. um, but thank you again. Yes, thank you. Thank you both. And thank you to NAM staff, supporters and partners, especially Elliott Bay Book Company for partnering with us on tonight's James Baldwin Circle program. We thank them for carrying Marcus's book, Readying to Rise. It is available at Elliott Bay Book Company for your purchase. And we welcome you all who are tuned in to come back to NAM's upcoming programs, including our Descendants series, interactive story time, and so much more. Visit us at our next Knowledge is Power book giveaway pop-up in a neighborhood near you. And be sure to follow us on social media and subscribe. Our three pillars here at the Northwest African American Museum is to advance justice and equity, cultivate educational empowerment, and center and celebrate Black history, art, and culture. We believe in changing our community, our nation, and our world through anti-racist education, inclusive history, and the power of the Black arts. And it takes writers like Marcus Harrison Green to help us make it happen. So again, congratulations to Marcus. We thank you for your writing, your words, and your wisdom. And thank you all for tuning in. Have a good night and we'll see you again soon. Thank you.